working in Glasgow uh, following uh, a bit time at COP26 at a really uh, critical moment where we've been discussing cities, regions and their built environment all day as part of the President's programme. Uh, so it's great to be here to have the opportunity to, to speak to everyone about the, the critical impact that the built environment has on the climate emergency, in particular the fact that it's responsible for 38% of global energy carbon emissions. Hopefully I've got that right. And it's fantastic to be joined here uh, today with, by two other presidents, so very honoured. Um, and it'd be great to learn a little bit from both of you about your time here at COP26 uh, and anything that re has resonated with you today that you think is really prevalent going forward. Peter, you're from the new world and you've been here more than anyone else, for longer than anyone else. So you should, you should tell us about, yeah, you've got the bigger picture, I think. Well, AIA has been here for two weeks. And uh, I think one of the things as architects, we like to feel like we own the built environment. But this climate crisis is clearly something that transcends, well, everything. It's, it, it's a critical moment for humanity. So I think one of the takeaways for me, and I think for the AIA, is how interconnected the built environment is with issues of power and the grid, with finance, um, obviously with governments and with politics. Uh, you know, at, at every moment we're seeing these intersections where I think architects can probably intersect a little bit more with other industries um, as we strive you know, for, for climate justice. That's a really good point, how about you Tim? Yeah, I mean I think it's this kind of, it seems to be an extraordinary day in the dark hall with people kind of actually all saying similar things. So there's a kind of group thing, but there's also a kind of convergence of ideas. And it's about collaboration. It's about learning. We need to learn from good and bad practice. Bad practice doesn't set out to be bad practice, but it might become bad practice. Absolutely, you know, it needs to be integrated. Energy, transport, and construction are the kind of the big drivers. But of course, energy forms construction in terms of embodied and operational. Transport is, can, can have a huge impact. So it's not just what we build, but as someone said earlier today, which I was quite interesting, it's the people who use the buildings who might then drive, drive carbon in, in another way. And you know, to me, it becomes this idea about, you know, we're talking about renewing and reusing. New buildings will be built. If you are building new buildings, you need to think about them as what I call forever buildings. Yeah. Therefore, they need to be generous. They need to be adaptable. Yeah, and there's a 50 year old saying about long life, loose fit, low energy. It's now you know, loose fit, longer life, and lower carbon. And yeah, but we shouldn't only fixate on carbon. We need to also think about the other challenges, you know, the ecosystems, pollutants. Yeah, carbon is it's a great buzzword and an absolutely crucial measure. But we need to always be kind of looking around so we don't get trapped into you know, a single route. Yeah, there's definitely a holistic attitude and it's coming across throughout all of the pavilions at, at COP, you know, throughout the other days as well, which is really interesting. There's a kind of cross-fertilisation in terms of knowledge sharing and experience across a lot of sectors, which is great to see. And I think it was really positive to see discussions on, you know, roadmaps today in terms of the delivery for the whole industry um, and, you know, going into infrastructure as well. I think my only concern is Know, how do we turn that into action? How do you know, you know, discussions today about the top down, bottom up? How do we actually translate that into something tangible for the memberships? You know, to actually use and implement in, in their day to day practice. There's so many ideas, but sometimes it feels quite high level. So how do you translate that to something that's going to make a difference in someone's office tomorrow? You know, that they can use. And I think that's you know a bit of a challenge for the professional bodies to help in that space as well. Um, but I, I don't know, there's probably a lot of things that the, the AA are doing to help with that. You know, America is a big country, obviously, same to the obvious. Just a few members. But we've been talking to a lot of mayors around the country. I was just in a session with uh, the mayor of Waverley, Massachusetts, who has vastly different um, concerns. The things that are keeping them up at night are quite different from the things that are keeping Mayor Francis Suarez in Miami up all night. Um, he is giving repeated rain bomb events. Miami floods when it's not raining. There's so much water. 
uh, in the earth and it, and it just rises. So I think what architects can do within their own communities is to see what is topical to them. We're at the intersection of a climate crisis, of systemic racism, and oh, and there's been a pandemic. Architects do our best work at the community level. And I think there's probably not an architect on the planet who's not seeing the ramifications of what's happening now in terms of climate and equity. And public health. And we have solutions that we can bring to, to the table. Is that, is that problem solving training that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about upskilling the industry and actually I think that there is maybe a new set of materials as a new approach, you know, there's, there's a lot of those words around all of that, but actually the skill set as an architect prepares you for that problem solving and those new challenges and, and that engagement with the client, which runs through, you know, early education right the way through to practice. So I think that's, you know, it's, uh, I think that's where we can fit in in terms of actually really helping to drive that action step forward, uh, which is really critical. I know the RIA also do. Yeah, I mean, I think this is thing about architects and not architecture. Architects can actually be clients, they can be involved in government, they can become you know, advocates, they can be involved you know, more directly in construction, they can be involved in many different things. That's one thing to realise, that the training and the profession does not necessarily result in problems. But it is, you said, great, great kind of skills is, I think, collaborative leadership and, and problem solving. But there are also very specific things. So whilst we're looking at that big picture, we need to get into the details. The big picture can overwhelm you. There's so much to be done that you almost get kind of you know, in, inertia built, built in. So I think yeah, we need to be looking at every project. Make the best measures you can of embodied and operational carbon. You know, get into that. Look at the longevity. Look at use. Look at associated things like transport. And, and recognise that actually Capture and publish data. The Institute needs to probably capture all our data and share it a bit more, not our personal data, but our carbon data. Share it a bit more, because I think you know, it's very difficult to work in a field where you're not quite sure, and then you can be plus or minus 10%. It's still better to measure than not, but the Institutes, I think, can, can do something to share knowledge. So, you know, the built environment uh, event that we held, you, know, you were at, I think you, you, you engaged online, was all about best practice in the world of exemplars judged by experts, not our institute or your institute or architects versus engineers, but actually, you know, if architects are doing something, it's because they're actually able to work better with the communities, the clients, the consultants and the contractors. So there's this also, we need to look beyond our industry, but there's so much we can do within because we're a big part of the problem. And obviously we, we need to be a big part of the solution. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose something to pick up on your earlier point and kind of tie that together is the RIS are looking at kind of, you know, build once for the future. What does that mean? It's got a time and place for each location, which taps into what you were saying about different needs in different places. But I think that attitude towards you know, bringing it through the consultancy phase, through design and, and then into the construction phase is, is so, so critical. And I think it crosses into something that came up today in terms of, um, actually monitoring metrics for buildings, post-occupancy evaluation, understanding uh, embodied carbon and those metrics that come with that, those statistics. And then it was challenged a little bit in terms of actually, should we just be measuring and sharing or should it be mandatory? You know, when does something, how do you take the industry with you in terms of starting to implement measuring and bringing about an understanding, when do you cross over into that mandatory kind of character stick was the, the metaphor used in, in the event earlier today. And I think that's a really hard transition for the industry to take, especially when there's the, you know, a certain desire and pressure to build onto the future, which also is, you know, has a lot of implications to it. So it's how you take that next step and then take the profession with you is really important, but there does need to be character. Um, but I suppose this is crossing over into regulation and into you know what we're probably all pushing governments uh, for and towards and helping to support them along the way as well. Yeah, and bottom line, architects are at the table at COP. That ought to be a point of pride for the members of our respective institutions. This is all of our institutes being in the conversation. As leaders, 
was spending time at Whitehall, at Con Congress, on Capitol Hill. This is something that we can scale across our institutes. Every single member of our institutes can talk with their local mayor, their, their councillor, about these issues that are, uh, uh, that are existential for us at this moment. I think, too, as leaders, one thing that we should be doing also is pushing that academy to revolutionize their curriculum, to be thinking about take, uh, preparing every student to graduate knowing how precisely to put out a net zero building. That will revolutionize most practices. It turns, it turns that graduating student into a very different- A commodity. Yeah. Which is really interesting. And I an know, innovator in, in that office. Definitely, and I suppose you know, this has been talked about in terms of the education programs at the RIBA as well, and, and in, your, in the liaison with the, with the schools throughout the country. Yeah, I think the, I mean, the, the, the strength of the RIBA's international program is going to drive that out internationally and, and help lead it internationally. It's not about leadership and glory, it's about you know, sharing knowledge. I think you know, it, it's a really interesting moment to think about what does an architect need to learn. It's a very dynamic world. So you know, I, I feel that the architect needs to kind of be given a, a grounding, a foundation in, in, in that topic you're talking about, which will then relate to problem solving because the world and the nature of that problem is going to continue to evolve. You know, the shift between body carbon and operational energy has been very dramatic in a very short period of time. Yeah. And that changes everything. We've got to continuously keep an eye as an institute by, by tapping into the intelligence of our profession on there, there'll be other shifts that will come and shift the way we approach it. So we've got to both equip people to do what you talked about there and to continuously keep an, an eye on the fact that this is a kind of a changing world and something else will, 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 will move that world sideways and we have to be able to respond quickly. And I think that's what institutes can do in terms of gathering their members' kind of ideas, driving thoughts, and recognizing there are different attitudes, yeah. and that's healthy. You know, we're looking for common ground, which is driving carbon out of our industry, but we also need to recognize that there may be things that are currently unfashionable that become fashionable, things that are currently fashionable that go out of fashion, and hybrids will emerge. I think it's actually just for pure design grounds, I don't know if you dealt it here, it's very exciting. You know, on, on humanitarian grounds, it's very worrying. On political grounds, it's very worrying. But you know, we, you mentioned finance. You know, the industry needs to be financed adequately to do this. So you know, if, you know, if you're going to be dynamic and you're going to research, the institute can gather data, but the, but the practitioners need to be adequately financed. Mm -hmm. That isn't a plea for fixed fees, it won't come about. It's a plea for people recognising what you need to do the job properly, because there's competency in other tests. You know, coming our way that needs to be dealt with. I mean, that, I suppose that also came up in dialogue in a couple of events today in terms of actually what does value mean for infrastructure, for building, for the built environment? You know, it turns into what is the value of consultancy, what is the value of the design services, what the value of the architect in that process? And I think it's often looked at at the moment still as capital costs. If you start to look at whole life, whole life carbon, whole life cost, that changes dramatically. I mean, the, the carbon overhaul, like, as, as opposed to looking at built and body, there's already, you know, that the evidence is there that that's very different. But the, again, when you start to look at the value of consultancy, it, it just changes that picture. And I think it brings back to something that was said at an event this morning, which was we need radical collaboration. And it's really, really stuck with me because I think when you are looking at that whole life carbon, whole life cost of the building for how long it's designed for, you need that radical collaboration. You need to think about all those points that you just mentioned in terms of actually drawing that into the process, along with all of the community aspects. And at the end of the day, it's the client, it's the end user, it's the homeowner, it's the consumer that needs to, to benefit from this in the long term. Going back to kind of the three points of, of, kind of the response to the climate emergency in terms of health and well-being, carbon, and biodiversity, you know, the the environment that you mentioned earlier around the building, the context and the user is just so important. But that radical collaboration idea actually brings every, everyone into the middle. Um, and if you recognise the value of the consultancy in the home life, 
of a building, then it, it, the perspective changes very dramatically from the way. Well, it probably needs it. help to change the perspective. Massively. I mean, I think it needs regulatory help. That's it's a huge finance. Change. Buildings are financial designs as well as everything else. If the regs create a more level playing field, then there is a reasonable chance that this topic, which however much is on the news in our industry, is still relatively niche. If you look at affordability, if you look at you know, the different wealth in different regions of this country, um, you know, we need financial models. I was at a talk this morning where you know, a client of mine was talking very lucidly about investing in green energy to supply for his buildings, and that there was investment waiting to come into London. But the uh, lady talking about African cities did not get to have that model of investment. So you need regulation to kind of level play fields to give actually everywhere it becomes mandatory. That will affect lots of other things, land prices, whatever it might be, because it becomes just part of the equation. So it can't just be a persuasion. And I think what's interesting is we. We've got to where we've got to because we were dragged up, I think, by regulation. The industry's almost accelerated through and past regulation, and we need acceleration regulation to, to exceed the industry again to set the industry new challenges. But that will also shift the financing and enable you know green investment to come in to build or renew the, the stock that needs to be doing. Because we're talking about, you know, if we're not going to build new and they've got expanding population, there's a massive amount of pressure for you, of course. New regulations for new buildings are dealing with a small amount of the world's stock. It's existing stock we need to address. Yeah, and that came up a lot today. I mean, I think I heard the word retrofitting and, and existing building stock about 100 times, which is really encouraging and there's a, there's a clear focus. I mean, is it the same? Obviously, it's a big issue in the UK at the moment, but is it the same for yourself? As, as my predecessor, Carl, I found uh, um, says the most sustainable building is the building that's already built. So, I mean, it's interesting that sometimes you can, you're operating in your own bubble, but you know, it's a global problem, um, which is mind blowing in terms of the difficulty in a, in a UK context on how we're going to overcome that. There was a lot of policy discussion around that today, which is really interesting. Yeah, but also, you know, we, we are members of institutes of those professions, learned societies, whatever you want to call us. The reality is, engineers have a huge role to play. Yeah. They design the frame. The frame is the first thing to go up and the last thing to come down. And I think that part of this thing is, is, is to actually recognise that you know, communal effort that is going to be involved. And, and what you've got is a communal goal. There is a problem about cost and not value being measured. There is a, you know, a commoditisation of everything, including our cities, that means it's you know, being, being disposable. And actually, we've got to now recycle and renew. But again, to me, that's, that, that's still architecture. The history of destruction, um, you know, at, at the tabula rasa, is essentially a 50 year, 60 year brick. Most buildings have historically been reused or recycled. So a lot of what we're talking about, we can find by looking back. And you know, someone said it's about it's about climbing on the shoulders of every generation and building up on the knowledge, not throwing it away and starting again. And learning from the mistakes, which you have to be yeah. And it's possible in this time where supply chain issues are you know, uh, in, in the moment that we could take this moment to to learn from that and perhaps there's a micro revolution will take place. Well, I think, yeah, we have a responsibility, I think, to build the contracts and change because at the moment they're quite generic and there's a lot of that has been discussed around fire safety in this country for very good reasons of tragedy and growth for. But that generic is the same for carbon. So if you're specifying a performance of a frame rather than its physical and carbon performance, it's it's very, very open. So this is detailed stuff. Again, we can't wait. We need to get on with it. Yeah. We need to do it. And it's how we implement that. I think it goes back to, you know, as membership organisations, it's, it's a bit like us attending COP over, you know, the last two weeks. You can be swept away in a very high level, very broad brush. And it's actually coming back down, sitting at your desk tomorrow, what change can it make? What do I do differently? How, how do I design And that the is next? you as an architect. Because I, I, my view is the institutes will not lead this. It's the it's members it. that will lead this. Yeah, definitely. But the institutes can help facilitate that sharing of data, that sharing yeah. of knowledge, and harness that energy, which they don't do as well as they might. Yeah. Well, 
Yeah. And I think it's, an, it, it's that, it's the idea of shifting, you know, going back to the metric conversation before and that data sharing, you know, it's the encouragement, I think, of the incorporation of institutes that actually, it's that open source, it's the opportunity to learn from those mistakes, to learn from how that building performs, really push each other and that, you know, that radical collaboration is, is pan-industry, but it can also be within our own institutes and corporations in terms of actually pushing, all members pushing each other quite collaboratively, and then across the organisations as well. Um, and and it's, yeah, that open source attitude in terms of actually we are in this together for a much bigger problem. There are challenges, not to that principle, but to that reality. I mean, sharing mistakes is a professional identity insurance issue. That's I mean, keeps coming up at events I'm at. Quite practical stuff, and that's where we've got to be clear. We've got to deal with the practicalities, because if you just talk of the big picture, sharing mistakes, yeah. you know, we're an industry where mistakes get portrayed in the press in a negative way. I'm not talking here about disastrous mistakes. I mean, but just kind of refinements. That's where you know, the greenwash idea comes from. And even in post occupancy, you get this a cover up going on. So, what we've got to realise is that sharing kind of data, with, of a building is performing well, but it can now perform better, and the next one can perform better, is societal progress. It's not a criticism. We don't want to be doing worse than the next building. So, the idea that you're kind of iteratively improving is actually the model to go. Radical improvement. Yeah, we've got to do it fast, but radical improvement also involves huge risks. And then you step back from it because it, you know, so what you need is speed, speedy, you know, fast advance, but continuous learning and feedback loops, which institutes can help, you know, channel and you know, give purpose. I suppose it's understanding that performance gap as well. So by saying mistakes was probably a little bit the wrong word in terms of actually we're still learning in terms of design to, to construction quality and it. it's that performance gap that we can look at and try We're relearning re what's already been forgotten. I mean, if you look at a good building from 100 years ago, it did most, it was probably made of stone, which is rather good, you know, it was probably naturally ventilated. Yeah. We're looking at that walking through glass yeah, today. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, here are three architects who felt very much at home today, the, the past couple of weeks of COP26. Architects really see the big picture. We are leading at this moment tens of thousands of architects throughout our three institutes here. There are over 100,000 amazing stories that each of those architects bring to the table. We need to start backing up those stories with this empirical data. The scientists who were at the conference at the RIDA last week were amazing exemplars of how to do that. We need these stories that talk about how people live their lives, how they prosper in their communities. This is what we facilitate through the buildings that we make for them. If we can just supplement those stories with these proof points, I think we are on, on the cusp of really contributing in a significant way to the way that we will solve the climate crisis. I suppose it's feeling whether that opportunity is there to take advantage of the skill set that can be brought to the table. I mean, I think it's the, uh, we've got to remember our clients are the people who commission us, but our clients are also the people who will use the building yeah. after they've been open, and they're the clients in the future who will adapt to the building. So our know, buildings now have a long-term purpose. And we've got to be kind of open, I think, and honest and transactional with all those different clients. I think clients now understand that. Our traditional clients who are our patrons and payers fees now understand that. But there's another group of clients. This is a conversation amongst specialists with big global news coverage. But you know, for ordinary people who are living less than satisfactory lives, this isn't their priority. So what we've got to remember is this isn't about desiring a low carbon future. This is about desiring a delightful low carbon future. And often people they should have better health, better education, a better quality of life, you know, and an opportunity you know, to, to kind of improve their personal lot. And I think that's really important that we don't kind of overfixate on the carbon. It's a bit like you know, we used to overfixate on the word sustainability. Mm. You know, the carbon is absolutely the driver and the measure of our metrics, but a low carbon building that no one wants to use is a high carbon building.
it's, it's getting to the point where it's regenerative in a way, so and it can go through various iterations in its, its own lifespan and adapt. And I think that agility has been talked a lot about in various aspects throughout the last two weeks. And it's how, how you can build in flexibility to your industry, to your business, to your, to your practice, to you know, institutions. Um, and I think that's, even from a business perspective, it's really interesting in how one might approach this going forward. Um, and also, again, how we can support members. Um, it's coming at it from all angles, practice, business, regulation, um, you know, the day-to-day -day in terms of actually taking the public and, and the consumer, the, the end user with us on this journey so that actually when people move into their homes and they take occupancy, it's understanding what their building does, how it performs, you know, the impact on their health that it might have, the benefits of living in that location, uh, access to biodiversity, amenity, the 20 minute neighbourhood um, in Scotland is, is a really big, big push and actually that, that's again quality of life, health and well-being. It's just joining all those dots together and I think again it comes back to that radical collaboration in terms of the structural engineer, the architect, everyone involved in that design process that's got a role in, in carbon but actually it's way wider than that in terms of delivery, it's your demolition contractor if there's one involved, it's the, the, you know, the waste um, management system the proprietor of the land, the purchase of the land, you know, it's, it's, it's such a wide net. Um, and actually, that's a big team of people to, to take on the journey that we've kind of heard discussed a few times today in terms of where we need to get to. But actually, the net is very wide. Our members, you know, they are, the, to me, the driver of the solution. It's their wit and intelligence will get there. Their ability to take people on a journey that's themselves their clients. There are things that are out on offer for them to utilise to do that. For instance, the RMS 2030 Challenge is an excellent document, I think, and it's client-friendly. It's simple, it's pithy, it's client-friendly, and it starts a conversation. So don't think because you've not met those targets today that you're not succeeding. You are succeeding by starting, if you haven't started, by starting that conversation with your colleagues with your clients, it then becomes part of the language of future projects, and that will, is the only way it will make progress. And Peter, how about you? What's the, what would you ask of your members, or what would you give? What advice would you give to your members about one thing to kind of take away from all of this? Three things. Three things. I like that. <laughs> I, I agree. Look at that, the twenty thirty challenge, and if you can sign on and, and think about how you might sign on in the future, I think. Uh, Mentor the young people in your office. Mentor a student. Talk to them about the future of practice. And whether you're an RIBA, uh, RIS member, or an AIA member, take a look at the guides to equitable practice at AIA.org. They're a roadmap for the future of our practice. And uh, they're, they're going to take us to an equitable future. I think, I mean, every, everything you both said is, is so apt. And I think for me, it's about there's often not the space created to think about these things. We are overwhelmed in the media with so much information. Even COP26 in itself, it is absolutely amazing, but it can be incredibly overwhelming. And I think one thing that you know, we would probably ask the members to do is take the time to think about your business, your practice, use the tools that everyone's mentioned here today, and actually take a step back and just dedicate that time in your practice to think about the smaller things that you could do better. You know, try not to get overwhelmed by those big moves and those incremental, you know, yeah. move in that incremental manner that you mentioned, Simon. And I think it's about creating that space. And we're very bad at doing it because we keep our heads down, we work very hard, you know, project deadlines get the best of everyone, but it's actually trying to carve that bit of time to just give yourself that headspace and take all of those incremental changes through your practice. Um, and I think the tools you know, are available, um, which is fantastic. It's no coincidence that this discussion in our industry, not just any in our industry, in our COP, has been massively accelerated by the incredible things of the pandemic. Because yeah. people, the world stopped in an extraordinary way. As you realize, the world could stop in an extraordinary way. And as, you know, as I found, and lots of people found, on one level, you had no time to continue as teams were doing, but on another level, there was time 
to think and reflect and when you're coming back to work to think. And actually, I think projects are kind of tunnels mm -hmm. and you need to get out of that tunnel. And actually, if you get out of the tunnel, you'll get through it a lot quicker. You know, and that's, that sort of pandemic taught me more than anything else is that actually we do need time to think. And I think it was really clear in, in one of the events last week that uh, there was a, a wide kind of range of businesses present at the event and they all said that they felt that, you know, if you weren't taking a sustainable route or sustainable business plan or building in that regenerative aspect to, to your practice, essentially you were building in obsolescence, you were becoming obsolete, you know, businesses are having to transform in order to step up and I think if they are our clients, if they are, you know, commissioning architecture, then you know that's a really positive step forward, and that will trickle down. But yes, you're completely right. I like the tunnel analogy. I think it's been worked. <laughs> the good one I had is, is you know, just talk stranded assets, and it's true. If you build yesterday's building, the chances is no, it might never be occupied, and that is, you know, that's no investment for climate or society. And I think yeah, that 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 buzzword is quite a good one to focus. All of our minds on what we're building for. We're building for, you know, for a longer, lower carbon future. Yeah. A wise person uh, on a keynote said today uh, the future of leadership is collaboration. Here we are, three institutes collaborating. Uh, I, I think COP has been very much an illustration of the potential of collaboration. So I would say to our, our institutes and our members, let's lead. Let's collaborate.